Hi, I'm Ranger Kyle. Welcome to the Elizabeth Cady Stanton home. She called this place the center of the rebellion, and in a lot of ways it really was. Before we get to that, however, we're going to talk about what made Elizabeth. She was born to a very wealthy family in Johnstown, New York. Her father was a judge, grandfather's a Revolutionary War hero. Her parents had 11 kids and five of them died, fortunately, including all of the boys. Most of them in infancy, but one brother, Eliezer, made it to age 20. He had just graduated law school, and as you might guess, he was everything to Judge Katie. He was going to inherit his mantle, take care of all of these girls, and when he sickened and died, this just wrecked the judge. A normally unemotional man, he would throw himself on the grave every day for months. This was the end of his hopes. No one was left to carry on his name. And Elizabeth, seeing this, was obviously very hurt. She worshipped her father, so she vowed to be everything her brother was. She would ride horses bareback, play chess, study Greek and Latin, and she would do very well. Her father would always praise her for these things, but always had the same answer at the end. One day she came home to tell him how excited she was that she had won a prize for excellence in Greek. He smiled and told her how wonderful it was, but at the end, the same as always, he would say, if only you'd been born a boy. As a judge, he knew how difficult life was going to be for Elizabeth. She was not going to grow up to be able to be a lawyer as she would have wanted to. She was not going to inherit his mantle. These ladies would come to his office and they would say, Judge Katie, my husband is gambling away my father's land. He would show them the law books, show them really how the land now technically belonged to their husbands. She sat there and watched as he explained to these ladies how the law didn't protect them. And she vowed to change that. As she grew up, her father kind of inspired her. When he saw her with knitting in her hand, he would take it out and replace it with a law book. He brought her to his law office to show off his smart daughter to the clerks there, who loved to tease her. One day she came in with her new coral necklace. She was very proud of it, showing it off. One of the law clerks said, Elizabeth, you know, if we were to be married, that necklace would be mine. I could take it and lock it away and you'd never see it again. Or I could trade it for a box of cigars and you could watch your necklace grow up, go up in smoke. This event really affected Elizabeth, as you might guess. Her, the wealthy, educated daughter of a judge, even she could not protect something as simple as a necklace. What hope did other women have? Now let's go inside and talk about what happened when Elizabeth decided to act. Elizabeth moved here in 1847, a year before the first Women's Rights Convention. She had come here from Boston, which, as you might guess, is a lot more fun. She was going to all kinds of abolitionist rallies, hanging out with radicals like Emerson and Thoreau. Her father, however, did not think this was so great. He did not see a place in the world for this thinking, thoughtful, questioning daughter. And he didn't like all the trouble she was getting into. So when she started talking about moving for her husband's health and career, he jumped on that idea, giving her this house way out in Seneca Falls. He probably thought that uh, she would come out here with her young kids, kind of calm down and stop getting into mischief. Those of you who know this story, probably guessing that that didn't work out so well, if that was his plan. Since uh, within a year of moving here, she organized this first women's rights convention. In Boston, she had lots of servants, three young kids, and was really enjoying running a household. Once she got here, she found a completely different world. 
all of the young girls were working in the mills down by the canal, and so she had a really hard time getting help. This meant that Elizabeth had to do a lot of the work herself. Today, running a large household is very difficult. Back then, it was even worse. You don't just throw your clothes in the washing machine. If your kid sprouts three inches over the summer, you can't just go buy them another set of clothes at the store. You're sewing those. So suddenly, her life is filled with all of this additional work that she wasn't used to. Even worse than all of the work, though, was the boredom. This was nothing like bustling Boston with all of its reformers and rallies. Here she was kind of starved for the attention and stimulation that she had been getting. This year, a lot of us can probably understand what she was going through. The sudden isolation, boredom, pretty much just stuck in her house, not able to go and do the things that she wanted to do. She was very bored, trapped here. She described herself as a caged lioness pacing her chambers. As you look around, the room we are in would have likely been her dining room. The house at the time was roughly twice this size, and out to my right would have been the kitchen wing. If you'll follow me, we will head into the next room. This is the double parlor where they'd spend most of their time playing the piano, singing songs. Elizabeth was a very attentive mother, though she had to do most of the work herself. Her husband, Henry, was always gone on business. When she met him, he was a famous abolitionist speaker himself. He was known as the Napoleon of the movement. After marrying Elizabeth, Judge Cady insisted that he study the law. So he became a lawyer, later dabbled in politics and even the ministry, though he got kicked out of ministry school for leading an abolitionist rally amongst the students. Elizabeth chafed under all of this housework, and around that time, she was invited to a tea party you might have heard of with some local reformers and her old friend Lucretia Mott. Elizabeth had met Lucretia Mott in London eight years before at the World Anti-Slavery Convention. There they had become fast friends and vowed that as soon as they returned home, they were going to have a convention for the rights of women. Unfortunately, life got in the way and they weren't able to do that. So now eight years later, as soon as she saw Lucretia, she resolved not to wait any longer. And a mere 10 days after the tea party, they had this first women's rights convention. Thereafter, the Stanton home became known as the center of the rebellion. Elizabeth, with lots of kids, was unable to travel very much. So everyone who was anyone in the reform movement would come here, stay with her for weeks or months at a time, chatting and making battle plans. Three years after this convention, in 1851, she met her future partner, Susan B. Anthony, and they complimented each other wonderfully. Elizabeth, while being trained kind of by her father's law book, she was an excellent writer. She wrote many of the speeches that people took around. She was also the theorist for the movement. Susan, without any kids, was free to travel the country giving all these speeches. She was also a great organizer, organized all the conventions, and even organized Elizabeth herself, who tended to get easily distracted. Susan and others would often come here, as I said, and stay. They would lock Elizabeth over here in her study and take care of the kids for her. So Elizabeth would finally have some time to do some of her writing. The kids, of course, were not super pumped when Aunt Susan was in charge. So she's a lot more strict. Now we will head upstairs for our last stop to talk more about the kids and how they influence Stan's life. This was likely Elizabeth's bedroom with the nursery beyond. The only other bedroom up here is the one over that way. Most of the bedrooms would have been in another missing wing over that direction. Stan had seven kids, two girls and five boys, and uh, 
particularly the older boys, were big troublemakers. <laughs> this was because of the way Stanton raised them. Elizabeth's mom was very strict. She would line her and her sisters up in matching red dresses every day and inspect them military style. So she vowed to pretty much do the opposite and let the kids run wild, doing whatever they wanted. She thought they would make their own mistakes, learn from them, and that they would end up better people for it. May have had a couple of hiccups here at the beginning. As uh, kids getting away with whatever they want, the older boys, one day they took their youngest brother, wrapped him up in cork, and threw him in the water to see if he would float. He was fine. He was also fine when she found him tied to the chimney. They obviously, they swore, they got into all kinds of trouble. She credits them, however, with introducing her to the local Irish immigrant women neighbors. They did this, as you might guess, by knocking down fences, letting the pigs out, breaking windows. So then she would go and she would meet these women. And she started to find out really how hard life was for regular women. She thought it was bad enough for her not being able to go to the college she wanted to and not being able to vote. Talking to these women, she found out that they have to work all day long for substandard wages. The money automatically goes to their husbands and fathers. Their husbands had complete power. They could punish or abuse with really no repercussions. So later on in life, this led Elizabeth to going for a lot of things that most suffragists did not think were immediately important. She tried to get divorce from abusive husbands, custody rights of kids, things like that. The rest of the suffrage movement was primarily focused on the vote at this time, and they found these things very distracting. Later in life, she went even farther by writing a book called The Woman's Bible. She believed that the main thing keeping women down in America was the church. Pastors would say things like, women are supposed to be second-class citizens, you're subordinate to your husband, you lack the intelligence necessary for more arduous tasks, and really you should still be being punished for Eve's original sin. So Elizabeth believed that even if women got the right to vote, that they would just vote in their own subjugation because of listening to these things about themselves. So she found that you have to change hearts and minds before you can change these other things in meaningful ways. So she wrote the Woman's Bible, which essentially goes over all of the passages in the Bible that had traditionally been used against women. She thus reinterprets these passages, and they don't sound nearly as bad under her version, shockingly. And as you might guess, this did not endear her to the pastors around the country who railed against her every day, nor did it make the Women's Christian Temperance Association very happy. Their suffrage organization had recently joined with the Women's Christian Temperance Association, and they did not like this talk against the Bible, so the people in charge effectively censured her and kind of cast her out of the movement a bit. Every time Elizabeth came up in the future, the opponents of this would bring up her Bible, and so they just stopped talking about her entirely, and she ended up kind of getting written out of history for a while. In addition to her work on the woman's Bible, she also had very radical, for the time, child rearing practices, though they must have worked for all of her children unusually survived to adulthood, and even more amazingly, six out of seven of them graduated college. Her oldest daughter grew up to be a professor of physical education. Her younger daughter helped pass the 19th Amendment. Even one of her sons moved to France and wrote on suffrage for the French. My favorite part of these tours is usually chatting with you folks, finding out what you're interested in, questions you have, Throughout this tour today, we've been learning about some of the things and the people who inspired Elizabeth. 
So now I'll ask you if you are following us on social media to head down into the comment section and tell us what or who inspires you.